welcome everybody to the first seminar of the new semester and the first seminar actually back in person here and also online so um thanks everyone for joining us it's really great that we can have so many people physically here in burnaby actually i don't want to move the webcam guys because i'm probably going to mess it up <laughs> but there are people behind there i promise um <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us i'm really excited that we're starting off the new seminars Oi. What are you doing? Oh, I see. Dave's trying to put me off already, which isn't a good start. Um, so I'm excited that we've got Carmen here. I actually have been very unprepared and don't have a, a bio. I can't be so late. I said it just 15 minutes ago. Oh, okay. Right. Well, I'm going to let Carmen introduce herself. Carmen is a wonderful colleague here at the University of Portsmouth for anybody online who is not in Portsmouth right now. And I'm going to let Carmen introduce yourself, if that's OK. Or I can madly look at my email. No, don't worry. <laughs> I'm happy to introduce myself. OK, fantastic. I will hand over to you then. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Carmen Solana. You probably can see it on the screen. I am a reader in volcanology and risk communication here at the, the School of Earth and Environmental, uh, the, the School of the Environment, <laughs> Geosciences, and uh, geology and geography <laughs> seg and um i have uh, i am a volcanologist i did my phd in the historical eruptions in the canary islands where i am from i'm from the island of tenerife and um and there has been well my my research is mainly in the mitigation of the impacts of natural disasters, but specifically on volcanic eruptions. Um, I'm, I also lead the MSc in Crisis and Disaster Management. For those of you, the Crisis and Disaster Management course that will be online, and we have some people here as well. Uh, and I'm going to be telling you today uh, about the very exciting opportunity that, that uh, started um, which was a volcanic eruption in the Canary Islands, where I am from, where I studied, and, um, and that they just started on the 19th of September. So just to give you a little bit of uh, background on, on it and on how you get about going to these places, you don't just sort of jump, jump on a place and go wherever you want when something like this happens. You need permission from the local groups. Luckily, I have been a scientific uh, I am part of the volcanic Institute, the Volcanological Institute of Canaries. I'm um, a member there, and because of that, as soon as I saw the uh, indications that the volcanic eruption was possible, I wrote to the director. I said that uh, my intention would be joining if that was all right, and he immediately said, "Absolutely, we can't uh, with you in here." So that's how you how you go about going to an eruption. You don't just arrive and expect. <clears throat> things to help people to help you and also just to let you know normally you have to make all your arrangements yourself which is um, can be challenging in in that um occasions but for me it was very lucky because if i'm from the canary islands i could just hop out there and i arrived in there on the 20th so um i took the next morning flight to the island so give you, giving you just a little bit of a background on the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's so let's go. If you click on the screen, will it then? Go? Yeah. There we go. So I would like to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to be telling you today, which is I'm going to give you an overview of the island, the precautions that were telling us that an eruption was likely to happen, um, some eruptive processes that we observed, the hazards that the eruption entailed, impacts and also a little bit on the management of emergency. So at the island of La Palma, first of all, just sort of to put you into play, uh, into place, the island of La Palma, yeah. the island of La Palma, which you can see here, is one of the youngest islands of the Canarian archipelago. They're all volcanic islands. Um, and La Palma has had very many historical eruptions. Uh, and therefore, we know that it's one of the youngest. The other um, island you might have heard of, the island of El Hierro, had an eruption in 2011, but it was a submarine eruption. So although Derek Rast and I were there, we didn't have the opportunity 
to see anything but staying on top of the sea, which was very, <laughs> it was very frustrating because of the return period of eruptions on the islands is between uh, 25 and 50 years. I, I, I estimated that I will be incredibly old if the 50 years <laughs> will happen from 2011, but luckily, well, or unluckily for the islanders, but luckily for me, I, um, I managed to see a live eruption in the Canaries and it was a look at the lavas, which is the topic I had studied in, in not, not live in, in my PhD. <clears throat> Just to give you a little bit also of, of information on the island, this is a Google Earth um, image. You can see the island is about 120 kilometers in length by about uh, 26 in width. Um, it's incredibly high. I, I'm doing this profile, so this is this line in here for you to see 2,358 meters. What, what basically you're seeing is incredibly steep slopes and remember that across here you're going to have about 20 kilometers which this means in terms of the population on the of the island is that the majority of the settlements are in these uh, areas in here so you can this is the capital and where the harbor and the airport are and then this is uh, the other mostly most populated part of the island <clears throat> because of it is flatter and in there is also where you have some of the plantations. The rest of the island, as you can see in the image, is very sparsely populated. Um, the island of La Palma is called the pretty island in Spanish, La Isla, um, uh, La Isla Bonita. Uh, it's, a, it's gorgeous. It's really off the beaten track. And these images that I show, they're just a selection of those. So there is a big caldera, if you, you probably notice an erosional feature in the middle that exposes a lot of the basement of the island. And at the same time, you also have a lot of uh, young volcanic cones. The last eruption previous to this one was 50 years ago, the um, eruption of Teneguia, 1971. As you can see, stunning landscapes lava flows, which probably are warning you of uh, processes, active processes <laughs> in the island, um, lots of water and uh, incredibly clear skies. So we have, um, with, the, with Hawaii, we have the, the, one of the top uh, observatories in the world in Roque de los Muchachos. Um, and, um, and you can see here some of those amazing skies. In terms of historical eruptions, there has been um, several you can see in here. So the, the lavas that you were just looking at on that picture that I was showing you, they're from the 1480 um, eruption. And you can see here you had another eruption in 1585, um, in 1677, in um, 1712. And then several last century, we had 1949, which produced several vents and lava flows that reach the sea in both sides of the island. Um, and then um, in 1971. So as you can see, the island is very active. And in fact, although it is deemed that uh, the island of El Hierro, the southern one I was showing you, is uh, younger in terms of products, this is the island that has shown more volcanic activity um, <clears throat> since the conquest of the islands and written history. Um, just, just to point out, this red star is showing where the eruption happened. Um, um, and you probably notice, that is something you might have seen on the television, how populated these areas are. So, um, yeah, as I said, some of the flattest parts of the island where people have built and where people are, have their livelihoods, their plantations, etc. You, you probably, those with a good eye for geology, can have noticed all these craters aligned in this area. This is called Cumbre Vieja. <clears throat> and it just shows how volcanic uh, islands um, typically grow, which is uh, throughout these sort of free zones in which most of the volcanism is going to concentrate. And that's why you have all these um, craters aligned. Um, I'm going to go a little bit quick because I want to tell you lots of things. I show you lots of videos. 
Um, but you will have, and also I want to give you the opportunity to ask questions at, at the end if you if you would like to ask any. <clears throat> but I would like to say that um, it looks like this eruption almost popped out of the blue because of the the precursors um, apparently started on the 11th of September, and the, so the seismicity started. A seismic swarm started on the 11th of September, but in reality, there had been very many other ones. Remember that the eruption happened on the 19th, so that would mean that within eight days, the magma might would have come to the surface. But in reality, there were seismic swarms in 2017 and 2018, 2020, and 2021, which is which must have been preparing um, the ground. And in here we have a, a really a, a, a great animation of the seismicity and how it migrates uh, to the surface. So just, just so you understand, in purple, you're going to see seismicity around the 11th of September turning blue around the 13th, green around the 15th, yellowish around the 17th and the 19th red. So you can see how it started at around 10 kilometers and you start having all the seismic, all the seismicity joining and eventually developing um, the op opening this fracture and developing the cone. I'm going to play it again because you you can see it like uh, this is the north south section of the area and this is the east west section and you can then see again from a different point of view how the magma starts ascending creating breaking the crust creating a path in order to um, reach the surface. <clears throat> Okay, let's go, enough. Other precursors to the eruption, they, it was deformation, ground deformation. So that basically means that uh, the ground uh, uplifted in some areas and it moved from the points that had been previously measured. This is again data from the uh, Geographical Institute of Spain, the IGN. And in here, this is just one of the several stations on the island. But I think you can see the very dramatic uh, change and uplift suffered um, from the uh, start of the seismicity at in the 11th of September, uh, which is marked in here. Mm, I think my face is in the way. Let me move it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, the start of the seismicity is marked in blue, and the start of the eruption is marked in red. And you can see this dramatic uplift. So in here, what we're looking is north-south uh, direction, east-west direction, and uplift. And this is in millimeters. So we're talking about uh, um, 240 millimeters uh, in total for uh, certain areas. And finally, um, the other precursor to the eruption it was um, the diffuse uh, emission of uh, carbon dioxide. So in here, you can see the day before the, the, the in Volcan, the group I belong to, the Volcanological Institute of Canaries, does regular um, surveying uh, monitoring of uh, diffuse emissions of different gases. And the day before the eruption, this was the scene. You can see very much um, areas that are very, um, that have a high, um, volume being emitted and the eruption, forget about this, this is just an area where they were concentrating. The eruption happened around here, so not very far from where the anomalies had been registered. <clears throat> and with this, I want to emphasize that um, we knew that the eruption could happen. We still were surprised how quickly it, it all developed. Um, the eruption of El Hierro had about three months of seismicity before. The, the magma managed to reach the surface. In the Palma, it was much quicker. <clears throat> and that meant that from the management point of view, by the time you activate your emergency plan, um, you, they really had a week to put things into place. So, I, I mean, for those of you following the management of the emergency, uh, you might have noticed that they went from um, from yellow in the traffic, the volcanic traffic lights went from yellow to red and never went via the orange <laughs> because of the was in time. It was it was a very fast developing um, um, emergency. So how was the start of the eruption? 
one of the amazing things of social media <clears throat> is that you know these days it's very difficult not to find information on everything this is an interesting video as well i hope there is sound maybe there is not but if there is sound you will see i think online they might not be able to hear sound so you might okay see sound all right it's it's much louder on my my telephone <laughs> um two things first of all what you can see is basically a column of smoke people people could feel the seismicity they knew that something could happen um so when they saw the column of the smoke, they knew that the volcano had, the eruption had started. And if, if I play it again, what you can hear is quite a lot of alarm. What happens to us? What, what's going to happen to us? And there's a child saying, the volcano is exploding, the volcano is exploding. And the father is saying, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so um, as you can see, quite sudden, you had this um, fracture opening in the ground and smoke uh, ascending. Luckily, there was, as I said, a team uh, measuring uh, diffuse gas emissions. And um, within less than an hour, they, were, they managed to film how the eruption was progressing. <clears throat> And what you can see there is um, basically the start of an effusive eruption. So you have white smoke, which is representing um, water vapor. <clears throat> you have this darker, um, darker gray, what it looks like smoke, which is mainly ash. And you can see in here all the lava that is being emitted from the fracture. You, you might even be able to see some volcanic bombs. They, in, in the telephone, they look a little bit more, um, a, a little bit better, a little bit more clear, but you can see some volcanic bombs also being produced. So almost immediately from the fracture opening and this, this sort of initial release of gas that produced the column, <clears throat> what we had, it was a fire fountain in and the effusive type of activity. So basically, lava reaching the surface. <clears throat> no, no, next one. Um, we, we, we somehow expected this type of eruption on the island. This is <clears throat> a Strombolian and effusive type of activity. It probably has given us some surprises and there might be more surprises on the sleeve. But basically, all the previous eruptions in the island, and the majority of the historical eruptions on the island had been um, of this sort, the Strombolian and effusive, and lava flows were expected. Ash and lapilli fall, um, gases, and uh, lava flows. Now, from the hazard's point of view, um, it's very interesting that the gases has been one of the features that has um, been more prominent on the eruption. And this is not only because of the gases that are in the column, which it was only a moment in which it's, it's, the column is not a very energetic one, it's relatively weak. And because of this, the, the, um, the wind has been able to bend it in many occasions. And that means that all those gases are getting very close to the population. But, but they dilute relatively quickly. There were more concerns from the gases produced by the interaction with seawater because of the, it creates other reactions and it creates uh, uh, gases that can be potentially quite uh, damaging. Uh, but also very important from the burning of the houses and all the materials that made up the houses. So for example, um, there were greenhouses with plastics on top, the burning of the plastic can be toxic. There were also industrial areas where there were oil depots and they managed to empty the oil before uh, the lava moved on top of them. There were also plantations that uh, uh, host uh, pesticides and one or as um, um, as fertilizers, and because of that, the burning of all these products uh, were more concerning than actually the gases coming from the uh, eruptive column. 
<clears throat> and of course, it produced uh, lava flows as we expected, and as I very happily managed to observe because of it is, as I said, um, my speciality. So just to show you a little bit of these hazards, uh, the column has been changing very much. There has been very energetic fire fountaining, similar to some of the ethnium paroxysm. For all of you that are um, volcano aficionados, you will have seen the, these jets of uh, lava from Etna. They call it in, in Canaries, they were calling it like the welding um, sword. This is called welding sword because of it was going upwards and the sound was um, very intense. So in the night, it was very dramatic. You could see the column of, of, um, of fire during the day. It sometimes showed that uh, red glowing, but there was also quite a lot of ash uh, being produced. And sometimes it was just a much more typical uh, weak uh, column. In terms of Lapili fall, there was, there has, it ha depending on the wind direction, it has been falling into many different, uh, in many different ways. Uh, and it has been affecting different places. You can see in here one morning, uh, this area appeared very covered and uh, <clears throat> some of the roads were covered by a substantial amount, which meant that you couldn't really circulate with a normal car. I happened, the, the first night I, I arrived on the 20th, I of course was desperate to see the lavas, to be, see the eruption. So I got myself to an area relatively close because of one part of this team, I met with some people on the team and they took me to, uh, to the sort of Southern area where the eruption was happening. I hadn't been on the island, it was nighttime. So we said bye, it, it started getting a bit more intense. It was raining quite a lot of ash. So I jumped on the car and as I started moving towards the road I was on, really large pyroclastic material, lapilli or quite large, started falling on the car so intensely I thought the, glass, the, the windows were going to break. So I had to turn around and go all the way around the southern part of the island across this really tiny road. It took me about two and a half hours to return to a place that it had taken me 20 minutes to drive to. But uh, this is the, the choice of, the, of being safe in the field. Always be safe on the field, don't risk it. You don't want your car broken, your windows broken or your head broken. Um, and the impact has been uh, important. I mean, when we were in there, this is the, uh, there is a local sport that is a sort of a fight, not dissimilar to sumo fighting, it's a balance and sort of non-violent type of fighting. And this was one of the um, stadiums where this takes place and the roof had been collapsed because of the weight of the ash. And very many houses and traditionally built on the island have flat roofs. So that was one of the hazards and one of the dangers and one of the impacts that the eruption could have had. And because of that, uh, a lot of firefighters have been uh, really um, taking the ash from the roof of the houses. Lava bombs have been produced um, in, in large amounts during all explosive and effusive periods. And also in day four of the eruption, there must have been some um, almost volcanic type of activity, some clogging of the conduit that produced some very intense explosions. And I managed to I managed to record a little bit of one. You're going to hear it. So you will see the blast, and then you will hear it uh, arriving. And look at the bombs in there. You see first the blast and then you hear the sound. Um, and you can see a large amount of uh, volcanic bombs. Look at some of these ones, They're really very, very large, falling uh, around the vent. I'll play it again because I think it's a really I cool video. Tell the audience that I won the bank, so. Oh, you cannot hear it. Hold on. I can actually. Sure Let me see. Um, I think I can oh, okay. share the sound. Is it, yeah, is that the one? I hope that helps. Okay, let's see if now people at home can hear it. <laughs> you can see the, the large uh, bombs just falling relatively close 
a few hundred meter, meters from the vent. But you never know when the next uh, intense explosion is going to occur. And because of that, uh, you want to be safe. So whenever we went to a place relatively close to the volcano, we, we had, before anything, we obviously had our hard hats all the time. And we, we looked at what we will do if one of these energetic explosions um, uh, produce a lot of bombs, where were we going to find shelter? So we'll say, OK, if there is one, everybody goes here, crouches, and so on. And that's, it. that's important to have that sort of procedures in place because once it happens if you don't know what to do you don't haven't got time to think so if you know what you have to do uh, that is great um and luckily we we didn't need it but but it was in there as i said the the gases in here you can see some of these plantations uh, <clears throat> the area because of it is relatively flat fertile land from volcanic uh, soils there were quite a lot of uh, greenhouses and the lavas were just moving through them, as well as houses. And we didn't really know the materials that were making up these houses. So they could have been um, um, important um, consequences. Um, but I'm going to center much of this talk in the lava flows and in some processes that we observed and we would like to um, that we would like to investigate further. I mean, I, I just came back through exactly three weeks. I left the island three weeks ago today. Uh, so, and last week it was master's start, <laughs> this week undergraduate starts. So I have to apologize. There is very little analysis of the things that I have done because I haven't had time, although I have a student that is helping me to collect this and collate this data. So first of all, I would like to show you how an immature uh, lava flow looks like. This is the first three hours. The thickness was about a meter and a half, uh, two meters thick. It was advancing at about 300 meters per hour. And um, this is a, a footage from Guardia Civil and in Volcan. You can see how it spreads on roads. So the moment they find a flat land, or a different slope, they spread um, broadly. And you can see in here how it just basically flows down from the slope. And uh, one of the things is that the movement is not especially fast. I mean, 300 meters, meters per hour is a fast speed for a lava flow. But there is this perception that a lot of people has that the lava moves at Kilometer, many kilometers per hour. And that is because of normally the footage that they show, and I will be showing you some of this footage, it happens inside the canal. And in there, it, it maintains the temperature much higher. It's all canalized into this, um, into this area and confined. And because of that, it can achieve uh, faster speeds. But that normally doesn't correlate at all with how the fronts are moving. And that's the important thing. What it is really destroying things are the fronts, not the material in the channels. <clears throat> and so within the first 30 hours, the flows were starting to establish. Uh, there was a much broader front. This is my picture. That's when I, uh, I arrived to the island. <clears throat> they were starting to be much thicker. And if we look at some of these houses, which are two or three meters, you can see that they're about six meters in height. But you, you know that it's an immature flow, first because of it hasn't developed yet these embankments in the, in, within the movement that are called leves, but also because you see all the incandescence in the front. So it shows that it is still very hot inside. This flow um, was moving at about 85 meters per hour. So you can see that within uh, 24 hours, roughly, it had decelerated substantially. And, uh, and it was starting to show advance by cooling and autobrachiation instead of the continuous movement that this type of lava flows normally display. And I have in here a video so you can see how this is moving. So it's a continuous type of movement, basically breaking. What you can see is that it is dislodging. This is not, um, this is not a liquid. Um, moving is much more a, a semi-solid material which is brecciating it is breaking itself in the movement am i doing time wise oh okay <laughs> let's 
try to, uh, how am I going to do this? Uh, no. Which one? This one. Okay. There we are. Thank you. Um, so by by day number two, the the flow field was much better established. You had um, well defined flows. They were still immature. You didn't see very many levees. These sort of barriers, but they were a bit thicker. They were wider. They the advance was relatively regular and slower which i mean it went from 60 to 25 meters per hour and by the end of that day it had decelerated to 13 meters per hour and they were by day number four they were quasi stationary so virtually not moving at all and this is quite typical it starts moving very fast but there is almost like a continuous deceleration as the flows are cooling down and solidifying and eventually even if the interiors might have some uh, material that this is still hot uh, and incandescent uh, the fronts have solidified so much that have basically effectively created a barrier that stops the movement so for other flows to develop then they have to pile backwards within the channels and overflow them or breach them or um or sometimes new flows come from the um, from the vent. So in here is the movement of a, a bit more mature flow. This is uh, again in yes. Chicas, creo que esta es la carretera donde estábamos eh, ayer sacando fotos. Es cerca de ella y la lava ya, como pueden ver, está por aquí. Se está moviendo más o menos. Eh, habíamos calculado en el otro frente y en este un metro por minuto velocidad máxima y a lo mejor como 4 metros por minuto velocidad mínima o sea 240 metros por hora o, o perdona 24 metros por hora o eh, 60 metros por hora de velocidad máxima Sorry, I, I, I make a verbal notes sometimes when I'm taking data and it's quite inconvenient for, for showing them videos but at least you can see I can speak Spanish. Chicas, creo que esta es la Let's go. Okay. By day six, the flow field have had evolved much more. You started, you saw well-defined levels, these embankments. You could see erosion within the flow field, areas with the large amounts of accumulation. What you see here is a, is a canal. You can see some incandescent. There were almost waves of uh, lava moving down uh, this canal and creating what looked like a wave that dissipated into some areas. And it, what it was doing, it was accumulated lava on, on some of these parts. <clears throat> it was obviously a much more complex flow field. And, um, and the, the thing to monitor here is these accumulations because of their uh, points from where new flows might be developing. Um, um, by day, I think this was day eight, there were some more reactivation of some fronts that had almost stagnated because of a new influx of lava. And I will show you the last video of lava flows moving, but I just want you to get a feel <laughs> of the difference between an immature and a mature lava flow um, um, moving. This is on a steeper slope than previous, and therefore uh, the apparent movement is quicker. But you can see that it's basically breaking down um, and rolling down um, from the front all these uh, all these um, blocks, and this is um, what creates the scoria that is in the base and at the top of uh, these lava flows. So when you see them dry, when you see them on the field, what you're going to see is all this escoriaceous um, <clears throat> surface and also an escoriation space that is produced by this movement and all this rolling of rocks in front of the lava flow. One of the big obsessions of the media and of people, it was the arrival of, uh, of the lavas to the sea. And I think this has been created because of someone mentioned that the contact between a water and magma could create um, quite toxic gases. Um, it actually translated in the media as a, a cloud of bleach was going to be moving around the island and things like that, which was um, very concerning, as you can imagine, from, from the population's point of view. Uh, I think um, 
there was also this expectation or this uh, uh, this thinking that once it arrived to the sea, it will create a channel to the sea and it will not produce any more destruction, which is unfortunately uh, not uh, not how this this works. <clears throat> so there were there are not that very many lava flow experts in the world, so I would like to encourage anybody in volcanologists. We need more people working on lava flows. They, somehow they're the Cinderella of, of the volcanology and they're incredibly, I think they're very beautiful and, and very interesting um, features of volcanic eruptions. And especially in the night, they glow, they're, they're, they're very attractive. So um, initially people, uh, some of the um, committee uh, that was advising civil protection were, were saying that the flows will arrive to the sea within two or three days, <clears throat> but it took uh, much longer to arrive and it took a, a, a much more um, intense effusion of lava from the vent to push <clears throat> these fronts to arrive to the sea. And that, uh, that was about uh, five and a half kilometers from the vent. As you can see, the well, you probably cannot see it in there, but you can see here that this part of the island has a substantial cliff and some platforms created by previous lava flows, which actually they're convenient flat areas to put more banana plantations. <clears throat> so what happened is that the lavas uh, reach um, the edge of the cliff. At the base, there was a rocky, um, a, a rocky beach. So it, that sort of didn't allow some of these blocks to produce a large splash. And it started piling up and eventually producing a very large platform that is still active and is still spreading. And eventually a new flow also produced a, a, another a branch that invaded another part of the island and it fell on top of the previous uh, lava delta. These are called lava deltas. So what's the current situation? I did say that I will show you some videos. These are from yesterday evening, sent by one of my colleagues in there. This is lava moving within a channel, so much faster than what I was showing you before. And this is what people sometimes see and think that it's moving at a huge speed. It actually, this is very fast. If this will be a lava front, it will be an incredibly fast front. But what you can see is that the lava inside the channel, it is still breaking into breaking into pieces. It's a little bit more uh, in, a, in a more plastic state. You can see part of the flowing at the same time as that outer branchiation of the fronts. Um, this was over an obstacle, so it was almost like a, um, a, a lava flow, a lava fall. Um, over a, a topographic step. And in here you can see a, a bit later on in the night how the very close to the vent the lava was moving at a higher speed. This is very close to the vent. So one of the things I would like you to maybe keep from this talk that I'm giving you, apart from the funny images, the, 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 the pretty pictures, is the fact that very close to the vent within channels you're going to have higher speed as you move down closer to the front the speeds are going to be reducing and the lava is going to be solidifying and once in the front it's going to differentiate in, in okay And just to show you how the, the lavas have been evolving, so in red is the first uh, days, then in yellow is by the, so the 20th of September, roughly the images I was showing you of the very mature flows. This is in the 29th of September, um, is in yellow, uh, 3rd of October in blue. This sort of darker red is the 10th of October. Um, Lava flows on the 12th of October, they're in green. You can see how the lava flow field is extending. There were some new vents that had opened uh, at the beginning of October. And yesterday, uh, these, pink, uh, these pink flows were invading what you, I'm sure you can see. It's a very highly populated area. 
And it was an area that was uh, thought that will be spared initially uh, because of uh, there were some topographic obstacles that the lava had to go over, but eventually it managed to go over them. So all this area is also being invaded. There has been a new evacuation. So there were people that were still living in here while the eruption was happening. But uh, yesterday night and today there was an evacuation. It was a difficult one. Again, from the management point of view, there was a moment in which there was a, um, um, a blackout. So there was, uh, the, the, there was no electricity on the island for a, a period of time. And at the same time, it was called the evacuation, <clears throat> which meant that it was during the night. They did manage to restore the electricity and evacuate people. But it's always much more difficult to do that during the night. This is very disrupting. And you can imagine how, um, from the personal point of view, uh, the, the impact that that has on the people of the island. So now what I want to show you is some processes that we witnessed that we think they were um, unusual, and that are some things that we're going to be looking at in detail. What, what I have been showing you is the typical development of flow field. There wasn't anything extraordinary. It was incredibly sad that it was invading so many areas. And very sad as well as I will say later that th there is no intention or no attempt to um, protect any areas because of the lack of legislation probably, or because of uh, not wanting problems, uh, legal problems later on. So it's, it's just, it's just letting the volcano do whatever it's going to be doing. <clears throat> but so far, most, most of the processes have been normal, but we witnessed some things that we haven't witnessed before and we're going to be investigating. So this is your first peek at research on the go. And this is in the area of Todoke. We, what we found is that <clears throat> there was some, um, the, these were the initial lava flows we were just making observations with a, a colleague from University College, Christopher Kilburn, another lava flows expert. And we saw what it looked like an active flow moving on top. And what we noticed is that it looked like it was a paler gray. It was moving what it looked like fastish in what it looks like waves. So you can see there some ridges. And because of this more violent type of movement, it was producing this cloud of dust. Um, not that long later, you can see it in here approaching quite of a important flow. This was about half an hour later, which is a very fast movement for a lava flow, especially on top of other ones. You can see these waves that I'm talking about, this sort of um, what it looks like reactivations. We, 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 need to, we need to think about this with a little bit more calm. Just look at this wall because of it looks like it hasn't moved very much, but um, that wall is in there now. This is about 10, 10 or 15 minutes later. It, it was a very violent uh, type of mo movement and it eventually um, kept moving, brecciating in this waves type of fashion. So that's something that we're going to look at. We we thought that the area where we were making the observations might be a dangerous one. So we moved it down to a different viewpoint. <clears throat> and this this is the flow reaching this area. And uh, let's see that it's moving quite fast. Remember the, the normal lava flows that we were looking previously. This is the uh, it's a very fast flow. It, it almost doubled in height to previous flows, and within it reactivated it. So the interior might not have been completely solid, and the extra weight and temperature of the flow moving on top might have created certain conditions that made it a, a much more active and violent flow. Um, and in this area, look at this uh, pink house because of. Um, in the next series, you can see how the flows are over the, the house. The house is buckling. Um, the house is destroyed um, and keeps moving up the road. This, this path in here, this, uh, this path that you can see on the right is the path that we had taken to go up. So we did very well to leave while we still had a, a safe path to escape. It wasn't 
that fast. We could walk in front, but you can see how, how fast it was moving. Um, and eventually this was a, a church for the village. It was an important um, point for the populations. You can see here the flows moving uh, towards it. You can see the um, smoke um, as it moves and destroys more houses. And eventually the, the church was taken away by the flows. Um, so this is one of the processes that we're going to look at footage, look at once the eruption finishes, we will try to see on the field how, if there is any difference between the, the lavas, these lavas and the previous ones. We have taken samples and we have some samples right now um, uh, that are being made into thin sections to see if there is any petrographic or petrological differences between them that might explain the behavior or maybe more, um, more vesicularity that might reduce the viscosity of the flows and make them uh, that much uh, more violent. The other pro process that we witnessed that it might be more common than we think, but we didn't expect that much in a sort of what it looked like a very effusive type of uh, volcanic eruption was this what it looked like blocky lava flows but not blocky lava flows from the rheology of the decomposition of the magmas and the rheology that that entails, but uh, blocky lava flows from, um, from a clastogenic origin. So what we think it might have happened, and again, that needs to be researched and we will be looking into it, is that some of this fire fountaining was producing accumulations of spatter that eventually became unstable and started flowing down the slope breaking and flowing down the slope <clears throat> and producing these sort of mass movements of a higher of a larger um, um, thickness uh, and sort of slow type of movement so in here you can see this this was very early on the eruption i think it was in day three and you can see how the um, the crater has an opening towards the south from where quite a lot of the lava is, is flowing. And eventually you see this mass of rock um, that is produced and is moving down the slope. And this is not your typical, I mean, you, you can even see from the naked, with the naked eye that it's not your typical lava flow. Um, a few days later, actually the next day, um, there were some indications that were interpreted by the committee, the scientific committee, as a possibility of the crater collapsing. So we were all um, told to evacuate the zone one, which was the high danger zone. Um, so I managed to get myself into a nice viewpoint and I saw this. So you can see what it looks like a similar, but a much larger um, volumetrically uh, flow of this type that is moving down the slope. And you can see it a little bit later and I have the timings for this. So I even have the speed at which it sort of started flowing as a mass type of flow down the slopes. So that's another thing we will try to find some evidences of, um, of this uh, behavior. I wanted to go back to the field. I have some viewpoints taken, but the, 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 the cone now is more than twice the height that you see in there over the ground. So all of this has been covered by ash, so I will have to figure out how to find bits and have some sort of good way to find out where these bits have gone to. But uh, the day after, we could see evidences of these much larger, very viscous flows. You can see here very large clusters. You can see here um, high steep levels. Um, we will see if we can access this at some point later on. Um, very quickly, the response, how am I doing 10 minutes? <laughs> okay, so there is an emergency plan in Spain for volcanic for volcanic eruptions, it's called the Pevolca. So I say the plan for volcanic uh, uh, emergencies in Canary. Um, it was activated as soon as the seismicity started and that involved getting uh, the emergency services into action as well as uh, the scientists to start uh, advising on the potential uh, pr progress of, of all the processes that were happening. What they did, because of La Palma, depends the, of the island of Tenerife. Not all the islands have that, the, their own administration. They, they, they are all grouped. 
in two islands, La Palma depends on Tenerife. So they sent from Tenerife a central command post, which is a, this, this big truck in here that opens sidewards. And basically you have some rooms with telecommunications, with a, a meeting room, and where you can organize the meetings with all the different uh, response groups. And you can see there that you had uh, the also um, the advanced uh, coordination points. You had the police, you had the army, you had all the different emergency services that were involved in responding to to this emergency. They even said that well, they, they even know they had set up as it should be <clears throat> a tent in which uh, the communications were coordinated. And we have, for example, we had to eventually we had to check in and out every time we went into the evacuation, different evacuation zones. We had to send a text message saying I was I actually happened to be in Volcan one team coming into evacuation zone one, two, three, whatever coming out of about so so at at any time they knew who was where. Because there were a lot of scientists, there must have been a, over a hundred scientists eventually from foreign people that came to see the eruption to support the monitoring, etc. And it can be very dangerous and they can end up unaccounted for. So it's very important to do that. And in order to access any of that area, you had to have a special permit <clears throat> and so on. You can see in here also some of the mitigation uh, from eruptions, which is cleaning the ash as soon as you come from any vehicle, they're cleaning the vehicle in there. Um, oh, sorry, as I said, uh, they, they were slow in raising the alert levels, um, probably because of inexperience. To begin with, the evacuation zone was very large. Nobody was allowed to go in, which was probably a little bit extreme. There was a bit more time for people to take their belongings, but inexperience creates some problems of this uh, sort. At the beginning also, I didn't have any credentials, but my University of Portsmouth card, and I went over there and they, and they say, with my helmet and my high vis jacket and everything, and they say, oh, hi, and I said, yeah, I'm a scientist. And I, I just showed this, and they let me go everywhere. So um, it was a bit disorganized to begin with, but uh, very quickly they decided that they had to have a system in which uh, people that were scientists, they were, because everybody started saying, I'm a scientist and I want to go to see the eruption, and there was no way to know if you were or you weren't. So uh, our there were three main working groups, and uh, one of them was in Volcan, and they actually send the list of people authorized to go in and out of these areas. <clears throat> in terms of response, lava flows, you can actually, um, you can act on lava flows. You can produce lava flow barriers that are going to contain flows. Sometimes they're going to protect special areas. And uh, it was fascinating to see some groups working towards it. So these were the firefighters. And they had been brought from all the islands because of they thought that just they were going to be able to, if, if they were forest fires or any sort of fires. As it happens, they explained me, which I didn't know, that when you have a really energetic uh, fire, for example, in, you see it also in forest fires, but you saw it much more clearly in the lavas, they're so, so hot that they create their own thermal system which moves upwards, which means that instead of the fire going outwards, it's sucking air from outside and it doesn't produce any fires. So the lava was moving on top of the ground with a lot of dry vegetation that normally would have been like kindled, would have produced fires anywhere. And no fire was produced. All, all the air was being sucked inwards and upwards by the high temperature of the lavas, which, was, which must have been at around a thousand degrees in this area. They I wanted the firefighters are quite action people. They couldn't just sit down in there to see houses being destroyed and they they wanted to do something about it. So um so they 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 thought on their own without any knowledge that they might be able to make a barrier. And when they spoke to me and I said, Yeah, they do it in Etna and it's very good, they were really and really happy because they were a bit demoralized sitting there just to watch houses being completely destroyed by the lava. Unfortunately, there is a lot of politics on these situations. Don't think that groups can do whatever they want. So they started piling up these uh, blocks and they started also collecting earth as, I mean, um, I, I told them that they, they had to cover it with volcanic rock, etc. So they were starting to do it when 
the Guardia Civil came and said, what are you doing? You cannot do this. And then the, the, um, I, the, um, the military um, came as well and they said, you cannot do this. And uh, they, they stopped it in part also because immediately neighbors started saying, oh, they're going to be the barriers. So that means that my house is going to be destroyed, but not someone else's. They're trying to protect the church. Some people were saying, we couldn't care less about the church. Other people, yes, protect the church. It started creating a situation in which, although there would have been options to at least attempt to protect uh, some areas, um, nothing was or has been done. They have left the lava just move in the direction they want to. <clears throat> But it just shows the, the, the politics involved. And also you need to have a legislation that allows you to decide that actually you're going to sacrifice this area in order to protect that other area. And probably we don't have that in Spain yet. And it might be something that we should look into. Italy, for example, where Etna volcano produces lava flows very frequently, has legislation in, in that sense. Um, and what else? Uh, the social impact has been huge. Um, the, the way in which uh, a lot of the Canarian society, and especially these people, operate is that they build, they normally, they live very close together. So normally the grandparents, the children, the uncles, the cousins, they all live relatively close together. So when the lava flows moved over an area, sometimes completely demolish the house of full families. And it is also traditional in there that you will go to your family house. So if, if, if your parents lose their house for whatever reason, you go to your children or your children come to you. But there wasn't any options because of living so close together, everybody had uh, lost their houses. And this was compounded by what was described by one person as an even war situation, which was losing the livelihood because a house can be reconstructed even on top of lava. But the problem is that when the plantations were destroyed, it was it's very difficult to recover that land. If you think, for example, earthquakes, floods, whatever you're talking about, you end up with the land. At the end of the day, there's a huge amount of destruction, but you have land. The problem with volcanic eruptions and, and a few other events like maybe radioactive clouds is that you cannot use the land for a very long period of time afterwards. So it means it's completely lost. And in a, an island that has limited space, that poses a really important problem from the point of view of um, where to go, how to continue your lifestyle. If you have been growing bananas for generations and you haven't got land anymore, how do you, how do you continue? In fact, it wasn't only the banana plantations and the land, it was also all the materials, all the uh, investment of machinery that some people had done. Uh, this man was almost crying on the television saying, I'm paying the mortgage for a lot of machinery, I'm paying the mortgage for my house and there's nothing. I haven't got anything and, and I don't know what's going to happen. So it was very, very difficult. And also it was very sad to see older people, which they see their lifestyle destroyed, and what made them wake up in the morning and stand up, it was going to attend their banana plantation. So their, their small banana plot or their plants, and it had all been destroyed. The schools are closed and there is a large number of evacuees, of evacuees which is compounded by the fact that there was a very violent forest fire uh, at the beginning of the summer and there were already evacuees on the island. So it's been difficult to accommodate everybody in, you know, in comfortable housing. <clears throat> we cannot forget that in these sort of societies and in, in, in rural societies, there is a lot of animals. There was a very well organized evacuation of animals and people uh, were so solidarious and they were offering their lands for um, their uh, for their goats and their cows and everything to, to move to. Chickens were left behind quite a lot and we found ourselves with some emergency services just cutting the, the fences and letting them go because it's, it's cruel to let them fry in there and there wasn't any food. Sometimes we, we throw part of our lunch to the, to the animals that we found around and put a bit of water because there wasn't any around with all the ash. And I think with that, I'm going to finish. It's quite late. In terms of the future, there is no indications that the eruption is uh, decaying, that the activity is going to uh, stop in the, in the next weeks. Eruptions in Canaries has lasted anything from a month to three months. Typically, there is one that lasted seven years. So hopefully <laughs> nothing like that will be, will be this one. But we, we might be expecting many more weeks of this activity. 
so yeah that's that's the future